Lord bless you, saints of the Most High God. Welcome to another Bible study uh, this great Wednesday evening. It's good to be back with all of us uh, to share from the Word of Almighty God. Uh, last week, we started on a series, Walking in the Word. And it is so very important that we understand that we grasp and get a good hold on the Word of God, the power of the Word, the value that lies in understanding the Word and living the Word. We, when we started last week, tried to establish that uh, God honors His word above his very name and that is very significant because all of us know that when it comes unto his name he is jealous over his name his name signifies a whole lot in fact in old testament times when we talk about the name of a person uh, just by virtue of the name we can have a sense of who the particular person is, the kind of character trait of the person. And a name in Old Testament times really meant a whole lot, yes? And so the very same thing applied to Almighty God. He revealed himself to his people on different occasions. And he used a particular name to reveal a particular aspect of himself, yes, to his people. And if he wanted to show his ability to provide in spite of challenges, in spite of the absence of certain material things to them, he wants to show his ability to provide, he revealed himself to them in a particular way and through a particular name. Hence, we would know about Jehovah Jireh and he was relating to his people and showing to them his ability to provide even when there seemed to be the absence of a particular thing. He can make a way and provide. And so he, through the name Jehovah Jireh, showed that he is able to provide. And so it is significant, the name of uh, Almighty God, the name that he used to reveal himself to people. So God treasures his name. His name means everything. When God called Moses and was directing him to go down to Egypt to speak to the Pharaohs, Yes, Moses knew, he recognized what was going to happen because for him to stand before the Pharaoh and say, thus set the Lord, set my people free, they are going to inquire, who is your God? What is his name? What am I going to tell them? Moses in reasoning to God was asking and God said, tell them and he gave him a particular name. I'm making the point here that the name is very important. It means everything. It speaks to the character of the person. It speaks to the ability of the person, yes, to do particular things. And so the name was significant. And especially as we are speaking about God Almighty, his name means everything. And yet, according to Psalm 138 and verse 2, we are seeing where the Bible is describing in no uncertain terms that God magnifies, God exalts his word even above his very name. The point I'm making, the point I want to highlight here. The point I want to bring across so that we embrace, that we grasp it, 
with everything that we have got is that God treasures, God honors his word highly. It means everything to him. You see, when God speaks, his word must come to pass. When God makes a promise, it means everything to him. When God declares a thing that it is going to happen, it has to happen. This is what makes him God. So his word means everything. His word means the whole world. If we dishonor the word of Almighty God, brothers and sisters, we are dishonoring God. And it is important that we understand that fact. I recognize that in Christianity today, a lot of folks, a lot of us, have taken lightly the words of Almighty God. And we do this to our detriment. We do this because we don't understand the value that God places upon his words. And his words, as I just said, means everything. He places significant value on this word. And woe to you, woe to me, if we undervalue, if we discredit, if we treat lightly the words of Almighty God. And so what I have done starting last week is to slowly build up so that we fully grasp the importance, the significance, the value of not just appreciating how crucial the words of Almighty God is in the church and in our lives, but that we understand that just hearing, just reading, just, you know, appreciating the word, while that is good, it is not enough. The words are there for us to take action on and to live them, yes? To take literal, physical, real-time action on. Because this is what God has given us. To, for us to understand and appreciate how he wants us to live. How we live, the things that we do, the things that we say, the way we interact one with the other, the way we interact uh, with our leaders, the way we interact with God himself, yes, is very important. And they are all outlined in the word of Almighty God. It is important that we realize, according to his writings through his servant Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, where he declares all scriptures. And we said it last week. He may choose to reveal some things, uh, through dreams. He may choose to reveal some things through visions and other means, but the mean, the, the most fundamental, the, 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 the choice method that God has used to keep his words at a level, to protect against it being passed down from one generation to another generation orally, and we know what can happen when the word is passed down orally. You start off, start off sorry, with one thing. And as it goes from generation to generation, a little bit of embellishment here, a little bit is left off there. And by the time it reaches the fourth generation going on, what we started out with and what is presently at that time going, is there to be passed on is going to be totally different. That is what 
always happen once there is oral transmission of the word. So God resorted to putting his word in writing. And so we have the scriptures. We have the Bible. And in that book represents the thing that Almighty God wants us to have, wants us to hold, wants us to know about him and his ways. How we should live. Why we are doing this. Why he wants us to do it that way. The fact that we should be separated. The fact that we should be clean. The fact that we should do this and not do that. It is all outlined in the word of God. And so 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 gives us a hint of how valuable, of how deep this book that we call the Bible is. It declares that all scriptures, yes, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable, yes, for doctrine and it goes on and it, we, we went through it last week and it clearly outlines so that the man of God may be perfect or mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And so we have this good book called the Bible. And in it represents everything that Almighty God would want us to have. And so having started last week in that particular way, we are going to pick up and we are going to establish some things. I believe that a lot of God's people have mistakenly and crucially, they have, as a result of making that mistake, have put themselves in a place where they are unaware of the serious repercussions of treating the word of God lightly. Many of God's people are unaware of the devastation that we can bring upon ourselves simply by us putting aside the things that are contained in this book that are written for our guidance, for our maturing in God, for our preparation for his return, and we have been deluded into believing that we can and we will make it into God's heaven anyway. Preachers and teachers over the years, because of what has happened in diluting the word, have reached the point where they have made it a free for, for all. You don't have to approach God through the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many other ways. Jesus cannot be the only way to God. After all, Christianity is just one religion out of many in the world. Why do we want to be dogmatic and make the case that Christianity alone and Jesus' name alone and all that kind of thing? And folks have therefore diluted this word. If the Bible declares that there is one way to God and that one way is by way of Jesus Christ, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That is word. That is Bible. We are going to have to stand up on that. We cannot allow somebody to come and try to shift our position because the position of the word remains the same. It never changes. It is the word of God. And if God came as a man, and that man is Jesus Christ, and Jesus is saying, I am the way to God, Yes, Jesus is saying, I am the door. And if you come or try to come to God any other way, you're going to be found to be a thief and a liar. That's Bible. That's Word. That Word was inspired by Almighty God. 
So I am trying to get all of us mm -hmm. back to a place where we understand the supremacy of the words of Almighty God, where we accept and we embrace the fact that all scriptures are given by inspiration of God and therefore must be taken seriously, must not be trampled on, yes, must be followed, must be adhered to, and we must be clear in our minds that these are majestic, powerful, pure, mm -hmm. beautiful words because they are from God. Make no mistake about it. There are those who would try to cause us to think and to believe that we don't need to make so much fuss about the word of God. It is subject to interpretation every time. And as time goes on, things evolve. And therefore, the word of God is not absolute. It will change depending on who read it. And if one scripture said it's today, it might not mean the same thing tomorrow based on how the society evolved. But I would like to declare that there are some absolutes in the Bible. There is no way we can change the fact that God is God and that he is the creator. And so some folks will try to say, let us reconcile evolution and the creation because we can believe that God did a part and evolution did a part. But if the Bible says that God made the heavens and the earth, let us not try to rationalize and reason and to inject the theology and the philosophy of men when it comes to the word of Almighty God. It is absolutely a fact that the earth was made by the words of Almighty God because the Bible says so. And that's not up for um, interpretation. That's not up for discussion and rationalization. It is absolute. It is the word of God. It is written here and I believe it and that settles it. In fact, it is written and that settles it whether I believe it or not. That is the word of Almighty God. And so I would want to use this series to get the saints of God to recognize the, the power, the supremacy of the word of Almighty God and for us to know that it provides a guide to our lives. Did you know that in the word of God it shows us how to live. It gives us spiritual guidance, the word of God. It gives us physical guidance. It gives us emotional guidance. The word of God gives us counsel on how to approach certain things, what to do and what not to do. Everything that we need to make it in our walk with God is contained in the word of God of Almighty God. And it's important that we understand that. There are folks that will try to dissuade you, try to dissuade us from following holy after the word because they believe that the word of God is onerous. It is too much. It is weighing them down. But I want to stand here to sit here this evening to teach us, to remind us, to declare to us that the words of Almighty God, they are not onerous. They are not heavy. They are not too much. The words of God are beautiful. Yes, they are lamps unto our feet. They are light unto our path. If we want to know the way, if we want to see clearly how to proceed in this messed up, dark, and evil world, it is important that we love, that we treasure, that we honor, that we embrace the word of Almighty God. Contained in this book is everything this is the roadmap that takes us to heaven. This is the roadmap 
This is the operational manual that will allow us to navigate the choppy waters of this world that we are living in. A rough world. And especially now we are going through a rough time. And it is going to get even rougher. But thank God for the word. And I would like to encourage every son of God. Every child of God. I would want to encourage right now every man, every woman. The elderly saints, the youngsters, those that are in between. I want us to be encouraged and to know that this book has the answer for every single thing, every situation that we will be confronted with. Yes, it speaks about holiness of living. And the term somehow today seems to be a heavy term for some people. It seemed to require too much of us as born-again believers. But as we said last week, the same emphasis that is placed on the salvation experience of being born again, according to St. John chapter 3 and verse 5, where it says, you must be born again. You must be born of water and the Spirit, signifying Baptism signifying the receiving of the Spirit of Almighty God. The same emphasis from the Word that is placed on that experience of salvation, of being born again, is also placed on the experience or on the lifestyle of holiness according to the book of Hebrews chapter 14. The same emphasis. We would not have known this except by the word of Almighty God. And the word declares, you must be born again. But equally the word declares, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And so it is crucial, brothers and sisters, that we love, that we embrace, that we follow, that we live the word. God requires it. Yes? And it doesn't matter who we are, we are going to have to pursue the word. Now, as we said before, none of us are perfect. Yet, the Bible instructs us to pursue, to seek unto, to strive for perfection. So as we walk in the word, we certainly will trip sometimes we certainly will stumble sometimes brothers and sisters and we are not for a moment believing that there are those who will go through who don't stumble and who are perfect and who will make it without a scratch or a bruise no that's not going to happen that's not going to happen we are we, we are aware of we understand that we are mortal men and that we are but flesh. And in our walk with God, there will be ergles for us to cross. And there will be patches in which we stumble. But the word of God, and this is why it is important for us to know and appreciate and understand and have the word. It is the very word that tells us that the righteous, though he falls, how many times will get up again? And move again. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We have got to be pressing. We have got to be moving. If we did not know the word, we would not know that the righteous, when he falls, don't get up. Seven times and he gets up and he gets up and he gets up and he gets up. The word brings that to our awareness. The word brings that to our attention. And it is crucial that all of us know the word for ourselves. So we take the time and we teach. We take the time and we present so that all of us can capture it and have it and hide it in our hearts. And then having received it, live it. 
Don't let anybody fool you. Don't let anybody fool us into believing. That all don't pay that in mind. That is just what the old time people used to do. But this is the 21st century and that does not apply to us. If it is in the book, it is for you. It is for all of us. And we are going to take some time and look through a couple of things so that we can understand that it is crucial that we follow the word. I am going to, going to break the sequence that I had because I was going to take us right now into a few slides to go through some things. But I really feel, I really want to uh, affirm even more the crucial nature of us seeing the word for what it is worth. It is so very important. It is so very crucial that you and I accept the word, not just as some things written in the book by a few men, but understand that while they were writing, they were being breathed upon by Almighty God. They were being inspired by Almighty God. I'm going this route, and I feel to go this route, even opening up and expanding this word a little bit more. I feel to go this route because it is important that we recognize that spirits move from generation to generation. Did you know that some of the things that happened back there in the time of Moses, that happened back there with Balaam and Balak, that happened back there with other men and women uh, from antiquity, did you know that spirits don't die and they traverse the generations and things that are happening today, uh, mindsets that are coming into the open today were mindsets that were there hundreds, I dare say thousands of years ago. It is important that we understand and that we recognize this because if we don't, then some of the things that happened to the saints back there, some of the things that happened to the people of God back there that caused them to fall, that caused them to succumb, and to lose out on their walk with God, we are going to find that those very things come again today and cause us to fall into the very same predicament that they had fallen into. And so we are going to use the book that says the things that are written are written for, for our admonition so that we can learn from the things that they had gone through, yes, and not fall into the same temptation, not yield to the same things. It is crucial that we appreciate and fully understand and grasp that. Very, very important. The Bible tells us, and follow closely, brothers and sisters, because I want to make two points using two different scriptures, and it goes to the heart of us appreciating the word of God. If we treat the word of God lightly, yes, if we undervalue, if we devalue the word of God, it doesn't matter how simple the word is that comes. It doesn't matter how simple the word is that we read. If we don't see the word of God as meaning everything in the world, if we don't see the word of God as having preeminence in all that we do, we are going to take some things for granted. Yes, we are going to allow some things to slip. And when these things begin to slip, it is what will result in our demise. Did you know that in the book of Genesis, when God gave instructions to Adam and Eve, 
and say of every tree that you could, is in the garden, you can eat of it, except this particular one. And did you know further that after he told them, don't eat of this one, because if you do, you will surely die. That was the word of God. It was not up for negotiation. It was not up for discussion. Because God made them remember what happened before that. From the dust of the earth, God formed a man and then breathed into that man the breath of life. Yes? And so man became living. He did not come of himself. He didn't own himself. He didn't start to breathe of his own accord. Everything about man came as a result of what God did. God made him. God put his breath into him. God owned him. And so God therefore instructed him how to proceed, even though he had a free will. God was able to talk to him and say, do this, don't do this. Yet I have given you a choice, but choose good, choose right. And God related to man. And so God told the couple, don't eat of this particular one. Because in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. But listen to the voice of the deceiver. Listen to the voice of the trickster, the enemy of your soul. Did God say you will surely die? Because you will really not surely die. In fact, if you eat of this thing, your eyes will be open and you will become like God's. So from the very beginning, there was an attempt of the devil, Satan himself, to cause us to reason in our minds that what is said in the word of Almighty God will not really happen. As it says, it is not really the word of God. Challenge it. Test it. What is going to happen? You're not really going to. You shall not surely die. But your eyes are going to be opened. And you shall be like God's. And this and that and all the things. And that is the very same trick, brothers and sisters. That is the very same approach. That is the very same strategy that Satan is using today to cause you and I to devalue the words of Almighty God. And I'm here to open our eyes and open our awareness for us to know that everything pertaining to our living in this life and for our making it into the life to come is written in this book. This book is breathed upon it is the breath of God. It is inspired by Almighty God. And the things that are therein, or herein, are true. They are honest. They will give life. They will show us how to proceed. They will give good counsel. They will give good direction. And if we fail to abide by what is contained therein, we will end up the same way that Adam and Eve ended. And I had to inject that. It is a trick of the enemy to tell you that everything that you read, that's not really what it means. You ever hear folks come and say, oh, that's not really what was being conveyed. That's not really what it means. In fact, the Bible, when we go through it, we see where all of us are sons of God. And we are maturing and becoming like God. And people twist the word. And people turn the word. And it is a trick of the enemy to cause saints of the living God to believe 
that this word is really not what it makes itself out to be. The Bible tells us in the book of Exodus, chapter 32, and I'm going to show you how easily it is for people to veer off, to careen off track. It's easy. It is the nature of humankind. But thank God that these things are written, that these things are here, so that we can see and we can do. You might not know, but you know, there's a, there was a time when God disowned his people, Israel, who he delivered out of the land of Egypt. Let me go through this particular episode in the life of the children of Israel. And I'm taking time to go through because I want us to understand and get the concept of how crucial it is to embrace the word. And if we don't embrace it, and if we don't stand solidly and firmly on the word, how easy it is for us to veer off track. A lot of God's people today are off track simply because they treated the word of God lightly. Simply because they don't read it, they don't live it, they just don't apply it to their lives. And it is impossible for any saint of God, I still use the word saint because we were born again, it is impossible for us to grow, it is impossible for us to mature as children of God and matriculate into greater heights and depths in God if we are not students of the word, if we don't read and apply and live the word of God in our daily lives. Christianity is more than going to church in a building, in your homes or wherever, and just clapping your hands and reading a scripture and hearing a message and then go back home. No, we spend two hours or three hours maximum, four hours maximum in any service. Once a week we stay that long. After that, what do we do? We have the rest of our lives to live. Our lives at home, our lives at work, our lives at school. What do we do with the rest of our lives? Because our Christianity is not judged when we are at church. Our Christianity is unsure when we are at home, when we are at work, when we are at school, when we are on the roadways, when we are in the public transportation system. Our Christianity is on display. When we are on the plane going into a foreign land, our Christianity is at full show when we are in a foreign land. Yes, that is a fact. So how we live when we are not being seen by men in church is very, very, very important. That becomes who you are. That becomes the mark of your Christianity. Remember, and we said it last week from the book of Corinthians, our lives are living epistles. An epistle is a letter. We are writing a letter with our lives that men will read. What is it that our epistle is saying when men see us cursing and swearing? What epistle, what letter is it that is being transmitted into the psychic, into the minds of the unsaved? What is it that we are writing on the whiteboard of their minds when they see us in display? on the beach, in the park, at school, at other places. What is it that we are saying to them at work? 
What is it that our neighbors are reading from our lives? For those of us that are married and live next door, and the neighbors are looking over and seeing or cursing and swearing and fighting and running after each other with machete. What message are we sending out? And it is the Bible that makes us understand that this is so because our lives are living epistles seen and read of all men. The word declares that. But because we don't know the word, because we fail to read and study and apply and understand the word, we don't even know that what we are doing in terms of our lives in the places where we go are impacting others because they are reading and they are seeing and it has been written in their hearts and they are saying that if that man is a Christian, I don't want to serve the God that he served. If that woman is a Christian, I, I, I have gone with her, I have gone with him. I, and they, they look at all the things. Did you know that when you hide and you go there with men and with women and we do the things that the Bible forbid us to do, the very people that you have gone with turn around and get ten more with them or seven more with them and say, look at that girl that says that she's a Christian. Look at that guy that says that he's a Christian. I was with that one and, I, and you become a laughing stock and you have written a long epistle and the epistle is that you don't serve a God that is worthy to be served. That is what we do. And we are unaware of that because we don't know that it is in the word. And the word said that our lives are epistles. The word, brothers and sisters, is important. And I cannot overemphasize that. And I therefore say to myself, I say to you, I say to all of us that are tuned in, understand that the word is there to guide us in every dimension of our lives. And we must walk in the word. The absence of that will result in every imaginable evil. We will not make it in the rapture. And I am not going to be one of those hypocritical pastors that don't want you to know the truth. And for you to know that if you are not living according to the word, then you are not going to make it. They know that you are living wrong and they see that things are happening wrong. And they see that uh, we are not going according to the precepts of the word of Almighty God. The things that are written both in Old and New Testament times. They see that we are not walking according to the requirements of God via the church. And they still leave us. They still leave you because they want to have the numbers and they, they leave you to go to hell. That's not good and that must not happen and that's not going to happen. I'm so sorry, but at the same time, I am happy to do what is right and to declare to all of us, irrespective of who you or I am, the word of God takes preeminence. The word of God is a sure foundation. The word of God is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word of God giveth life. And if we are not walking according to the word, we are going to declare it as we are doing now. I love you and I'm just going through this in love. But I must tell us and I will not hide it. And I will not pretend that you are doing good when it is clear that we are walking contrary to the word. And I want to be governed by the word. And what a thing if I am organizing myself and trying to do my best for myself and telling those that are close to me to walk in the word. But I am not doing that to you because I just want you to, to stay. Because if I tell you the truth, you might go away. And then if you go away, we, we, not, we have offering and we're not going to have this and we're not going to have that. I will be doing you a disservice. How can I see folks on their way to a devil's hell and not like a watchman rise up and declare the word and show us that we are going wrong? That will not happen. Certainly not with 
this pastor. It cannot happen. It will not happen. And God knows that I love all of us like my own soul. And if I want to make it, then I want you to make it. Because I know that all of us can. We just want to make up our minds and we want to live in the word. So we are on the subject, walking in the word. So the Bible tells us that Moses went up and was about 40 days in the presence of the Lord. Yes? And he was there praying and he was there fasting and the Lord was directing him and the fingers of God wrote on some tablets that Moses had. So you know that he was in the presence of Almighty God. But while he was there in the presence of God, he left Aaron in charge of the people, his people, the children of Israel. Follow. God through miraculous means, through his powerful right hand, according to the book of Exodus, he delivered them with his right hand. That means through his mighty power, he did great and marvelous things to grant the deliverance of his people Israel from the land of Egypt. He opened the Red Sea and he caused them to go over on dry land. And as the enemy came in to catch them and take them back into bondage, God caused the waters to come together again and to drown the armies of the most powerful nation on earth at that time, the nation of Egypt. And God brought his people over and we know the story well. However, there came a point in time, as I just mentioned, that Moses withdrew himself to go into the presence of Almighty God, seeking God's face. And he said, Aaron, I'm going up into the presence of the Lord. I'm going up into the mountain and I'm going to be there for a while. Over 40 days, I'm going to be spending time prostrating myself before Almighty God and going through and finding the mind of God and receiving from the throne room the words of Almighty God. And Moses said to Aaron, stay here with the people. And Moses went up. Did you know that during the time that Moses was in the mountain, the people... The same people that saw God Almighty working and acting on their behalf saw the power of God when he came down on the mount to give them the Ten Commandments, saw the power of God Yes, when the mountain shook and the smoke rose up and cried out to Moses and said, don't make him talk to us, we just, you let him talk to you and you come back to us. These same people that saw the power of God when he opened the Red Sea, these same people that saw the power of God being manifested in un no uncertain terms, no, Moses was up in the mountain in the presence of Almighty God. And here it is that after a couple of days, they call him Aaron. Say, Aaron, we haven't seen this man Moses. He's gone up purportedly to talk to God. But we don't hear from him and we don't see him. Actually, he thinks he's all that anyway. And they talk to Aaron. And here it was that Aaron would say, no. But Moses, God spoke through him. But Moses, you saw what he did. But Moses, you know that the Lord worked with Moses and worked through Moses and we are here because of God. And the people sat down with Aaron. And in spite of knowing all that was already outlined, 
where God told them that you must serve no other God, where God told them that I am a jealous God, where they knew the word of God, they convinced Aaron and told Aaron that, look, we want to serve God. In fact, we want to keep a feast to the Lord. And if we look into the scripture in Exodus 32, we are going to see how serious this is. Because here it is that they actually called the name of the Lord. It was capital L-O-R-D. So they were referring to the true God. And they were saying that we want to have a feast to him. And we want to serve him. And guess what happened? Aaron acceded to the request of the people who said we are going to worship God but we are going to worship him the way that we think is the best way is the same God we're going to serve is the same God that we want to worship but we are going to worship him the way that we see best brothers and sisters that is contrary to the word and that is why I am saying to us, it is important that we understand and take seriously the things that are in the world. Because God established a particular way that if we are going to come to him, we must come that way. And if we are going to worship him, we are going to have to worship him that way. And if we are going to be children of God, we are going to have to live a certain life the way that he prescribed from the book. It is always the intent intention of the wicked one to come up with another way contrary to the word and then use folks to present things to the leaders which is what they did right in Exodus 32 and came to Aaron and said Aaron we're going to serve God but here always the best way. Because look here, we're not saying we're not going to sing. We're not saying we're not going to clap. We're not saying we're not going to build an altar. We're not saying we're not going to dance. We're going to do all those things, which is what God wants. But you know that as men, we have to see, you know, who we worship. You know that as men, we can't get together in marriage unless we, 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 we taste of what is going to happen because we have to be sure that is a real lady we have to be sure that is a real man we have to be sure and the people justify they justified everything using good reason at that to the extent that Aaron said all right Aaron was a spiritual leader no, in the absence of Moses, who was away seeking God. And Aaron was the person who God said of him, when Moses go down to talk to Pharaoh, I'm going to make Aaron be a mouthpiece. So no doubt Aaron was called. And Aaron was in the will of God. And Aaron had a role to play in the life of the people of Israel and yet they convince Aaron to build a golden calf and everybody contributed to that image and when the image was set up brothers and sisters the folks looked at the image and bowed before the image and said blessed be the Lord. Before the image that they made and convinced Aaron, the man of God, said nothing do wrong with it. And, Aaron, and look, they built an altar. I want us to read the entire Exodus 32. And they built an altar. Then after they built the altar, they said that they were worshipping the Lord and they had a feast unto the capital L-O-R-D, which means they claimed that they were worshipping Jehovah. 
the God, the great God of Israel, whose name they, they, they didn't want to even call on their tongues. And yet, while they are saying that it is the Lord that we have built this altar to, and the Lord that we are having this feast for, and they were clapping and dancing around the, 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 the golden altar, worshipping. But here's what happened that a lot of us are unaware of. The Lord literally disowned those people. As we go down, we're going to see that God eventually got rid of them. They were killed. God got rid of them. Because, but after a while. So there was a period in time, a period of time, that they were there worshipping. That they were there gallivanting. That they were there, and when I say worshipping, false worship. Going through the motion. Saying that they were feasting at the table of Jehovah. Yes, an altar was there and they were at the altar. And they were calling on the name of the Lord. But how God allow that? Because God always allows some things until he is ready to move. The point that I'm making is this. They were going through, carrying on, doing the things that were not according to the word and they were deluded in their minds. They thought they were okay. They knew they were doing wrong, but they thought they were okay. And so what we're going to find is when we know we're doing wrong, but we're still in the mix of the worship, there's going to be the sense that we are all right. But brothers and sisters, we're not all right. Because if we are not living in the word, if we are not walking in the word, and if we are not serving God according to his precepts, based on the word, then it don't matter if we feel a dance. Because the children of Israel that were around the golden calf were dancing. It doesn't matter if we feel to bow down at the altars. Because the children of Israel that served the golden calf, they had an altar that they built and they were at the altar. It doesn't matter if you're having communion. Because the people that were serving the golden calf had a feast unto the Lord according to the book of Exodus. So they were doing the things that the Bible required them to do. A feast unto the Lord, building an altar, dancing in his presence. They were doing it, but not according to the word. Not according to the word. When we don't know the word, brothers and sisters, we are in for trouble. We might be doing a death dance and we don't even know. Be careful how you mess around. Let us be careful how we mess around with Almighty God who treasures his word above his very name. You know that Exodus 32 and verse 7, if we read it, it says, and here's a little part, and I want us to notice this. Notice clearly what it says. Get thee down. And this is God talking to Moses. And the Lord said unto Moses. Go ye down. Get thee down. For thy people. Notice what he says. Thy people. Not my people. Him say, your people, Moses, few people, which thou <laughs> brought us, thou Moses. So here we do, go down to your people who you brought up out of the land of Egypt.
go down to them, for they have corrupted themselves. So God now decided that he was going to act. But God was now disowning them. So they were down there dancing. They were down there dancing. They were down there gallivanting. They were down there worshipping. They were down there at the altar. They were down there having communion or a feast unto the Lord. And yet God said they have corrupted themselves. Because we don't do and come into the presence of God and do worship how we feel like. We come into the presence of God and do worship how he instructs us. He tells us what kind of people we are to be. He tells us how our minds are to be. He tells us and gives us the, the process and the procedure in terms of holiness of living. And he said holiness must be our watchword and our song. And he gives us the practical aspect of true holiness and he tells us that it is an inward thing and he tells us how we are to think towards our brother and he tells us how we are to think towards our sister and he tells us how we are to think and relate to him almighty God he tells us if we are going to come what we are to do you know did you know as we said we said it Sunday you know that if we are going to make an offering we have to be careful how we come with the offering because we can't just come anyway but for whatever reason we don't understand the word and look at the principles of things and know that we just can't come to God anyway. And some folks will say, no, oh God, Jesus died for you. So Jesus, make the way. So just come as you are. We don't even understand what just as I am without one plea means. Saints believe that get up out of the bed of fornication last night and then come to church this morning and run, come in and just start. We have messed up what worship is. We have messed up ourselves coming into the presence of God and don't even realize that God, for some of us, he has already disowned us. And he just didn't disown us simply because he wants to disown us. He, he actually drew himself away because had God been near to some of us, because some of us know that God has withdrawn himself, you know. We know. We know there's, there are no, there's no presence of God around us. We know, but we are just going through the motion. But had God been near to us, given our state and constant living in lie and hypocrisy and sin and witchcraft and, 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 and fornication, if God was near to us, he would have killed some of us already. So God drew back to protect us. But notice in verse 7, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go get thee down for thy people which thou broughtest. Is not Moses bring them from Egypt? Is God? Is not Moses' people? Is God's people? But listen to God talking to Moses now. And said, Thy people, him disowning them, him is not calling them his people. Thy people who you brought out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. But Moses responded back to him in verse 11. Yes. In verse 11, Moses responded. And here, here Moses speaking. And Moses besought the Lord his God. And said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people? So in verse 7, God is saying, Moses is your people. And now see it here in verse 11, Moses is saying, God is thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. God is actually disconnecting himself and disowning them and saying, they are not my people. And if we go over to, to, to chapter 33, we're going to see God handing them back over to Moses again. But the point we are making is this, brothers and sisters. The point we are making is this. The people were there worshipping. 
The people were there dancing, singing. The people were there at the altar. Yes. The people were there having a feast unto the Lord. And while they were doing all of that, God disowned them. They didn't even know. They had no knowledge that this was the conversation going on between Almighty God and Moses himself. God saying to Moses, are your people, are you bring them out? <laughs> Moses saying, no God, are your people, are you bring them out? And by we get to chapter 33, God still turned it back to Moses. He says, your people, is you bring them out? God disowned them because they chose not to follow the things that are written in the word. And when it comes to the word that is God breathed, God breathed upon the word. When it comes to the word, when it comes to the book, it is important that we don't make no mistake. And we know what God requires of us. And some of us, our conscience are telling us that how we are walking, the, the road that we are trodden on, the avenue and the things that we are pursuing, our consciences are telling us that something is wrong. But we are running recklessly down that road because we don't choose to walk in the word. And our conscience after a while is going to be seared with a hot iron. And things that we were once sensitive to. Yes, things that we were once sensitive to. We are no longer, after a while, going to be sensitive to it. So there are some people, after a while, you see, you see them go a certain way. You see them do some things. You see them act certain ways. And you say, oh, is that? Being a child of God, their minds, their consciences have now become insensitive because over and over they have trampled on the word. And when we have trampled the word, we have put ourselves in a place where we have no conscience where the word of God is concerned. And I tell, I, 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 I tell us, I tell us the truth and I lie not. Be careful, lest God disown us. So here it was, in the book of Numbers, chapter 22. And I'm going slowly, you know, brethren. Deliberately going slowly. Because we have the slides and we have the things to go in. Because I'm saying all this to come back to a particular point. So this is word. Yes, this is word, you know. We're going into word. We're not just giving knowledge now and information. That, that, that excite and incite us. Like what we're talking, as we said last week, about the Antichrist and the beast and the this and the that. Those are things coming and those are crucial that we know those things and we know it. But we better be ready. We better know as a fact that we are walking in the word. Otherwise, the beast will come eat us. And the Antichrist will have us for supper. Yes. So if we're singing Beulah Land, we better sing with understanding and know that it don't just come by buck up. I can safely tell any one of us right now that no child of God, no Christian, nobody is going to make it into heaven by buck up. It is going to be deliberate or you're not going to be there. If you hip and scotch and a little here and a little there and think we'll go, boy, I don't know, you know, but one thing, you know, if I just go in by the skin of my teeth, I'm going to go, oh, no, I'm going, you know, if, if I ever find myself in there, I don't matter, it don't matter to me where I end up, I'm going to go, oh, no, I'm make it squeeze through the pearly gate. Oh, nobody going to get there by buck up. We either going to have the assurance and we deliberately walk with God and we make it. And if you don't have that blessed assurance and if you're not deliberate in your actions, and we know if we are not walking in the word. 
And if your conscience is telling you, if our consciences are bearing witness that we are not in the word, it means that if we make it, it's buck up. And I am telling us, and I can safely say, none of us are going to be there by buck up. Deliberate, walk with God, blessed assurance that we are with him. And I'm still not insisting that any one of us are perfect. And there are some things that God is going to have to cover for some of us because some of us make mistakes. All of us make mistakes. And there are some things that God will cover. And I am telling us, however, that if we are deliberate, if we are willful, if we are not walking properly, if we are not walking in the word, if we don't know this and put it in our hearts and live by it, then we cannot pursue a holy life. And the Bible is clear that without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And it is not onerous. It is not a weight on the shoulder of, a, of any Christian. It is a beautiful thing to find ourselves smack in the will of God. It is a beauty to be led by the Spirit of God, to look into his word and to pattern our lives and parallel, parallel our lives with the word of Almighty God. It is a beautiful thing for a child of God to pursue Jesus. Can you imagine us in prayer? Can you imagine us in fasting? Can you imagine us constantly in the word, seeking the face of God. There is no presence. There is no place. There is nothing, absolutely nothing on this earth that can be compared to being in the presence of Almighty God. It, 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 it cannot be described. And what a thing it is for us to present ourselves to him, holy, and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service for what he has done and for who he is. It is our reasonable service. Yes, it is. And so it is important for us, brothers and sisters, and I, I, and I am speaking to us from my heart. I am speaking to us in all honesty. I am being very open and I am being very frank. It is important that we understand that. I cannot in all conscience see anyone going down the wrong road, a slippery slope, and not use this mean and other means to say not so, not according to the word. Let's turn around. And so we're going to get into that, you know. So I am slowly, as I said earlier on, establishing the foundation and setting the pace so that we can go to some things that I have outlined in slides that all of us need to know. But I mentioned just now a man by the name of Balaam in the book of Numbers chapter number 22 and I want us tonight to read it. Don't let the night pass and we don't read through. So tonight we are going to finish Bible study and you are going to capture it and you are going to go back into your Bibles and you are going to be reading the book of Exodus 32 and you are going to look at that first scripture that we just read and look at that episode. Very important. Some of us, when we read, we don't look at some details, but the detailed things are there so that we can see and understand some things that can really happen. And Balaam was a prophet in Old Testament times and Numbers 22 tells us the story, the episode with Balaam. For Balak wanted to curse Israel. They saw Israel come across and they were fearful of these people that God Almighty had made to come from out of the land of Egypt and was journeying onward to the promised land. And when Balak saw them and heard all that they did, he was fearful and he called Balaam the prophet to come over to curse the children of Israel, whom God had already blessed. And so Balak sent some men of high standing to go to Balaam with gifts and beautiful words. 
to say to Balaam, the prophet, our master wants you to curse Israel. And after they spend the night with Balaam, Balaam said, Tarry till morning, I am going to seek the Lord. And Balaam sought the Lord. And that night in seeking the Lord, the Lord said, Who are those men? Balaam. Balaam said, These are the men that came from Balak, who is the king of Moab. And they have come and they have asked for this and they have their nice men and they are men of high regard. And God said, Look here. They want me to come down with them tomorrow, God. And I'm just seeking your face to get a word from you because based on your word, I will move or not move. Based on your word, I will order my steps. Hmm. Brothers and sisters, God spoke to Balaam that night. Brothers and sisters, God gave his word to Balaam that night. And the word of the Lord is, don't go with them. And Balaam got up the morning and told them, I spoke to the Lord, but the Lord did not give me leaf. He that did not give me the unction. He did not give me the go ahead to go with you. So you have to go. And they persuaded the prophet Balaam. And Balaam said, look here, as the Lord liveth, I can't do except what the Lord said to do. So I'm not coming. For God said, no, go. But I want us to follow that episode, brothers and sisters, clearly. I want us to follow that episode clearly. Because it speaks eloquently to our situation and condition today and it doesn't matter who we are it doesn't matter our position it doesn't matter how long we are saved i'm speaking from my heart you know bible study walking in the world but I, I i really want these thoughts to come out and to permeate the atmosphere and get into our system because they speak to reality and real life things. They are practical. God's word was that Balaam don't go with the men. And did you know that the men went away and came back and asked Balaam the same thing? And did you know that Balaam went back to God and said, God, talk to me, the man, because nothing now going to happen. I just go, me go and go with them. It's just... I, I'm not even going, you don't say don't curse them. So I'm not going to curse them. I'm going to just go with them. God's word was simply, do not go. Furthermore, the word says you can't curse them because God already blessed them. So here is how Satan is wicked, but here is how he still work. So all right, we're not going to curse them. I may not going to curse them, God. But at least, I can just walk with them. And go up to see Balaam, Balak. After all, I'm not going to curse them. But the word said, don't go. Now, if the word said, don't go, and you still decide to you're going to go, what God going to do? Because he has given us the power to choose. Brothers and sisters, this is how the devil tricks us. With the one part, but not the other. And convince ourselves that we are still in the world. Because ultimately, God said don't curse them, so we're not going to curse them. But we just have to walk with them. What wrong with the walk with them? Is, 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 is men of stature, you know? Somebody can walk with them. Is men from the courts of the palace of Bielak, you know? Somebody can walk with them. 
But the word said, don't walk with them. Don't go. Although it said, don't curse them. It also said, don't go. And Balaam go back to God like he want to try to soften up God. But God's word stand. But look what God did. God said, all right, go on. Go on. But we don't understand what happened here. Because although the verse say, go on. By the following verse, when him I'll get up and jump down with them now. You see the donkey, what Balaam was riding on, going down to Balak. The Bible said God was angry. God's wrath was kindled against Balaam. Why? No, God said, must go. God never tell him to go. God said, don't go. But the man persisted with God and said, God, nothing no wrong with it. God, that, me not go curse him. God draw back and said, go on. The fact that God was angry and his anger was kindled against him as he went is indicative that he was going against the will of God. Many times when we go against the will of God and God don't strike us, down dead, we think that God is with it and God is all right. Lie from hell. God will allow the thing to go on even though he's not with it. And we, in our minds, crazy enough to believe that all is well. Because see, God not kill me. See, me can still dance. See, me can still have a feast in the house. See, me can still sing. See, me can still preach. Lie from the pit of hell. God's wrath was kindled against him. Because he decided to go even when the word was clear. Do not go. I hope we are picking up and seeing where I'm going. I hope we are understanding the point that I'm trying to make. That not because we feel and we have a run in our feet. Mean that everything all right. When we know we are not walking in the word. We know we have to keep in mind. I don't, we're coming. Let me not jump the gun. Let me just finish re-establish the point. So that as we go into the slides and start look at practical ways in walking in the word we all can see where we fit in because as night follows day or day follows night if we walk contrary to the word irrespective of how we still look like we're walking and we're going on and we're going through. God allowed Balaam to go with the men, but he was angry. And Balaam never knew. Yes? Be careful that God not angry with some of us because of how we're living. We really know if God is with us, smiling, embracing us. We really know if God angry with us because God can be angry and we don't even know Simply because we are naive to the things that are contained in the word. Walking in the word is crucial. It will make win. And this is why we must be in the word. Because the word keeps our conscience soft. The word keeps our conscience clean and clear and sensitive. So that if God is angry, we will know. For we sense it and we feel it. But after a while, we just keep doing the wrong thing to the extent that God no going to make a move at us and we don't even know. We're going headlong in the same way, thinking all is well. And, wo and that's why the scripture comes, you know, he that continues to stiffen his neck after God over and over and over deals with him about a matter and we stiffen with neck and our necks can become stiff simply because we become immune to the things in the world. We do it one time, we do it two times, we do it three times, we become insensitive to the fact that it is wrong. It now becomes a part of our life. We lie and we cheat and we steal and we do all kind of things. We backbite our brothers, we speak hateful words, we hate our brothers. Don't you know people who hate folks are considered murderers? And God have a way to deal with murderers from the scripture but because we don't read it and we're not walking in it we don't know so we continue to hate and backbite and tear down and all of those things 
Well, I'm closing tonight. But that donkey that Balaam rode had to talk to him. And Balaam licked the donkey and called the donkey fool. And when the donkey talked back to him, Balaam talking to the donkey. And Balaam don't know, say, is the donkey him talking to? And calling the donkey fool. And all kind of derogatory word. And Balaam is talking to the donkey. You know, say, Balaam fool too. To be having the conversation with the donkey, calling the donkey stupid. And, how him not, and, how, and all the things how him, ta- descri- how him describing the donkey. Not realizing that it's a donkey he's talking to. Not realizing his state. Brothers and sisters, God had to show up in his mercy. Crush him foot. That's Balaam's foot against a stone and fell to the ground. And God showed up. That was God being merciful because he didn't have to show up in that way. His foot could have been crushed to the ground and then ultimately died. The Bible spoke of another prophet who God said, don't stop to the left nor to the right. Don't take this word and go across. And when you finish the life, go straight back and don't stop to the left, don't stop to the right. Don't talk to nobody here nor there. And the prophet did everything according to the word. And when he was coming back, another prophet stopped him. And he said, no, I can't stop. Because the Lord said, don't stop the word, say. And then the man convinced him. So, but if you did do the thing already and you're here now, come eat this and continue, man. Because the same word. And you're on your way. And you're following through. It's so Satan operate. And you know what the prophet did? He stop and go eat with the other prophet. After God said, no, stop and turn to your right or to your left. And he was convinced that nothing was wrong. Is that Satan always? There's nothing wrong with this. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with if, 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 if so so what? Pastor said this. Pastor said that. Leader said this. Nothing wrong if you, you know if you obey everything with them say. Obey some. Obey all. Pastor don't want you obey for him word. The leaders don't want you obey their word. I don't want to obey a man's word. I want to know that. I am obeying the word of God. God allowed a lion to wait for that prophet and kill him along the way. I don't think we understand, and I have used these for us to see how dangerous it is for us to trample, for us to treat lightly, for us to disregard, for us to devalue. The words of Almighty God. It is a serious thing. And we can be on our way to hell and don't even know. Because we have allowed our consciences to become cold and callous. And we are no longer even impressed that we are on the wrong track. So I I close this evening at this point. I really wanted to establish a few things i really wanted to make the point from bible from scripture and i I am sorry i hadn't come over into new testament scriptures but it is there we said it on sunday in acts chapter 6 one of the very deacons that were chosen what i mean is what is in the bible there were seven of them and one of them was Nicholas. And they were deacons. None of them don't name Nicholas. So I just quote it from the scriptures. One of them was Nicholas. And that man, Nicholas, history tells us, did some stuff. And his conscience, after a while, didn't bother him. Because the fact that he was chosen, and the Bible declared, you know, they were men that were of good report, all seven of them, men that were filled with the Holy Ghost. And if the apostles back, back there, past men filled, they were filled. So this Nicholas was in the church. Holy Ghost, good report, everything right. And was in the number of the deacons. 
And yet this man, Nicholas, became the leader of a group that later on were called the Nicolaitans, whose deeds Jesus hated. Yes, whose deeds Jesus hated. Yet he was in the church. It is possible to be in the church, to be walking with God over a period of time. And because we were not in the world, we become sidetracked and then lose our way. And sometimes we lose our way and don't even know. Because the things then continue for long afterwards, did not even know. Be careful. As I close, every one of the seven churches had commendations and or things that they were upbraided for. Lack things that they should have been doing that they didn't do, and they were upbraided for. That first church of Ephesus, and we spoke about it on Sunday, as I close, there is a point that I didn't make that I really should have made, and I make it in closing, and it comes back to the word. That church, notice, they were patient. Yes. They know how to try those that say that they are apostles and are not. Yes. So they were discerning. Yes. They, they would not give up, though they were under pressure. Yes. So they knew how to press and to persevere. And these were all good traits. This is what every Christian aspired to. And these are things that Jesus commended them for. Yet, sorry, they, they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans who tried to convince men to get involved in sexual immorality. Telling them that it's not wrong to be walking around naked, whether in a private beach or on the road in public. And you, you, some folks are walking around publicly naked. Because if you are at a private beach or a private place and you put it on the public sphere, it means that you are walking around in public naked. Deeds of the Nicolaitans. And Jesus hated that. And yet with all of that, Jesus, with all the good things and traits that that church had, Jesus said, one thing I have a problem with. I have somewhat against you. You have left your first love. Yes? You have left. Watch this. How do you reignite that love? How can you lose that love? And if you lose it, how do you reignite it? Jesus made a profound statement. In St. John, I believe this is 14 and verse 15. The test of love is this. Keep my words. Those people left their first love when they walked away, when they disregarded, when they devalued, when they belittled the word of God, which is everything. The word tells us that we must pray. The word tells us that we must fast. The word tells us how to live. The word tells us how to treat with each other. The word gives us counsel in relation to every facet and area of our lives. If we walk away from the word, we are bound to lose our love for God. And Jesus corroborated that when he said, if you love me, keep my 
commandments. If you love me, keep my words. If you love me, walk in the word. I close this evening, yes, on that note. And I challenge every saint of God. Don't let nobody pull you out of the word of God. We have to be resolute now. We have to be radical now. The, 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 the weak Christians who, who choose to be weak and choose to walk a, a certain way are saying that they are radical and we're not conforming to established ways of serving God. Those that mean God well must now become radical and get in the word and walk in the word. Your soul salvation and your eternity is at stake. And we better get radical and take this thing by force. The Bible declares that the kingdom of God suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. Gonna better force your way into the kingdom. Don't make nobody stop you. Don't allow nobody to influence you out of the kingdom of Almighty God. Come thus far. And you have find no fault in him. Let us press on. Yes. And we have got to walk in the word in order to press on. The Lord bless you. We close this evening. And God's willing, next week we move into some slides because I want to take us step by step next week through some things as it relates to how we must live in the word practically because at the end of the day our walk with God is a practical experience it is not reading the word and then looking up and just sitting at our house for the rest of the week and then Sunday we come to church read the Bible they go back home read pray and look up that's not practical Christian living practical Christianity is when we finish in the word and we digest the word we get up and we live we live at school and we live at work and we live at our homes. And wherever we go, we are a child of God. We are first called to be saints and we must be saints everywhere we are. And we can only be saints if we maintain our first love. And how do we maintain our first love? If you love me, keep my words. God bless you tonight in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus. God's willing, next week, same time. And we go into some more, a little bit deeper, a little bit more into walking in the word. The Lord bless you in the name of the Lord Jesus. Can we bow our heads at this time as we pray? Father, we thank you. We bless your great name. Thank you for another time to share from the good book that outlined the words of God to us. We bless you, Lord. We honor you. Help us, mighty God, to honor your words, to magnify your words, to elevate your words in our lives. Help us, Lord, to digest. And having received and embraced and digested the word, help us to walk practically in the world. We ask you for your help. We ask you for your guidance, almighty God. I pray for our young people, beautiful people they are, a desire they have to serve you. I pray, mighty God, that you will show yourself to them, show yourself strong on their behalf, O oh great God. Let none of them be lost. Hold them in the hollows of your hand, mighty God. Show them your way and teach them your will. I pray for those that are the elders amongst us, the mothers and the fathers in Zion. Thank you for what you have done through them in helping them to show us the way. Help us to follow them as they follow Christ. I pray for those who are the middle-aged in our midst. They straddle the gap between the elders and the youngsters. I pray that you will help us, Lord, to walk with you, to love your words, to magnify you above all so that we can be examples of the believers in words, in in, in, in lifestyle and in every way, in every respect. Have your own way. Let your perfect will be done. Bless this land. Bless our leaders, I pray. The prime minister is cabinet ministers. I pray for the leader of the opposition. My God, and those that shadow the opposition 
positions with him. I pray that as leaders of this land, you will help them to lead us and to guide us. You let your perfect will be done, we pray. We look to heaven. We wait upon you. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, the Lord bless you. The Lord keep every one of you. And God's willing, as we say, we look forward to being here again next week, same time. Remember now, we have two books that we would like you to have in your library. Um, one, the one that I did on the end times, One Minute to Midnight. Um, it is on Amazon. And I ask as we close, all those folks that have purchased books on Amazon, please, there is a section that you need to go back on to give a review of the book. It is very important that you review that, uh, give a review, sorry, to that book. It's very important to the placement of the book on the search engine of Amazon. And I am personally asking, please, get back on. You ordered and you got your book. Please read through and get back on quickly and give a review. Your review in terms of, if it is a good review that is, your review will certainly help to advance the book. And so I ask every one of you on Amazon, please, to read and then give that review. It will be a great help to me in the name of the Lord. And the book is available locally at our office at 29 Lindale Avenue. Or remember, you can go on the WhatsApp, WhatsApp and, and make your order and you will hear from us. The Lord bless you in the name of the Lord. And also our sister, Sister Carrie Ann Barrett. Amen. She did her book. Um, it is running across the screen. You will see it there in a little while also. Uh, her book is not available in paperback. However, it is on Amazon and you can get it there. It is entitled Surviving Work. Yes, so surviving work, it is being shown on the screen. Surviving work, it is available on Amazon. Just type in surviving work by Kerryon Barrett and you will get to it. And I ask all uh, to make that purchase. Very interesting book. It speaks to the time and the challenges at the workplace. And when you make your purchase, very important, please go back and give a review of that book also, Surviving Work. It is important in that it assists the placement of the book, and that is important. I'm sure that that will be important to Sister Barrett. So the Lord bless you. Looking forward to seeing us in church on Sunday. Group 3 is coming out. I remember we did say that we are going to be making some adjustments very shortly. Listen out for that. I meet with our deacons tomorrow. We are going to make a decision so that we, God's willing, we will only rotate once every other week so that we will be more often back in church as we get back to normalcy. So we are going to be working on that. You will be hearing uh, from us on that shortly. But until then, Sunday coming, it will be just group three. And we invite the members of the group three team to be out for service this Sunday morning at 10.30. So God bless you. And remember, the books will be here for all those members from group three. Yes, and I have been calling the office. Your books will be here. So you can come and you can have them. And anybody else that had missed out from group one or group two, you can just pick it up on Sunday. It will be at church. Amen. For pick up and purchase. The Lord bless you. And I say, if not on the air next week, then in the air. I look forward to seeing all of us again in the name of the Lord Jesus. God bless you in Jesus' name. Praise God.